Hi, Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church in Monroe, Iowa. Welcome to our Bible study time. I would like to begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to study your word, to take it in, to drink it in, to let it be our spiritual food. Give us grace, Lord, as we listen, as we read, as we understand that these words were meant for our salvation. Lord, let us be glad in this and give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we are going to study Psalm 32. Now, <clears throat> as I share this, I'm aware that this is the week of Christmas. And some may wonder, well, why do we have to keep studying the Psalms uh, in Christmas? Why can't we go to a Christmas passage? And I thought about that, and I, and I realized, well, you just might find in the Psalms messages that are uh, very relevant for Christmas. And also, uh, we will discover that the more we understand the Psalms, the more we see how integrated they are in the rest of Scripture, uh, including and especially the New Testament, such as uh, most definitely the case with regards to Psalm 32, which is what we are going to study today. It's a, it's a different psalm. It's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. I'll read it in its entirety, and then we'll go back. Uh, it says, Of David and Maskil, which is a type of song to sing in worship uh, in the in the midst of the congregation, which is what all psalms are. Here we go. <clears throat> Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away. Though my groaning all through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. In uh, reading uh, several commentaries, um, one of the things that they like to do is to describe, well, what kind of a psalm is this? And um, a common one, like, for example, uh, the one in my RSV uh, NRSV, uh, New Revised Standard Version, is this is the Wesley, uh, the Wesley Bible that I that I have. Uh, it titles it um, the Joy of Forgiveness. Now that's not a title that you'll find in the original um, Hebrew. Uh, that's something that a, an interpreter of this psalm would put down. Other uh, commentaries would say this is a Thanksgiving for forgiveness type of psalm or a, uh, a penitential psalm, if you will. Others uh, would say it, it's, it's sort of, a, uh, of an instruction on how to be forgiven, a roadmap to, to forgiveness. Uh, it's interesting to try to describe what a psalm is. It gives us an idea of how to, how to see it. Uh, in this case, the psalm uh, begins with Beatitudes. In other words, the word 
happy, which is the same one, same word that is um, blessed or blessed, uh, that Jesus, when he speaks his Beatitudes, uh, the Hebrew word would be happy. Here, happy are those whose transgressions is forgiven. So in, in a sense, um, the psalmist is equating forgiveness with happiness or blessedness. I am happy. I feel blessed when I am forgiven. That's a little different way of thinking of the word happy. You know, when sometimes when, when you and I think of ourselves as being happy, it's because, well, we've it's been a good day or I'm healthy. Um, someone was nice to me or I, I got a gift. Um, I've had a good productive day and I, I go to bed uh, with that great sense of satisfaction. That's one way of thinking about happiness. But here the psalmist says, happy are those whose transgression is forgiven. And the psalmist uses three words for sin. Um, how do you spell sin? Uh, the first one is transgression, which means uh, willful rebellion. The second word is sin itself, the word sin, which means to miss the mark. We use the word trespass, uh, like a, a, an archer shooting at a target and missing the target, missing the mark, falling short of the mark, sin. And then the other word is iniquity, which means guilt. And we find these in the first two verses. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Uh, happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. That's another word. Um, deceit would be another understanding of or another part of uh, sin. Uh, it's, it's, it's what we do with the sin when we try to deceive God and ourselves from the sin that we have committed by not uh, holding it up and, and making it unhidden when we try to hide our sin. That's deception. That's deceit. Um, <clears throat> interesting. How he begins, happy rather, are those who do not cover up their sin. Now, the when we find, when we think of this word, whose sin is, happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It's not talking about us covering our sins. It's talking about God covering our sin. In other words, God has now uh, put his grace on the fact that we sinned. Uh, we can't take it away. It's not like we never did it. Yes, we did. But God has now covered. He's, it's like saying, I got it covered. It's okay. And then later in verse 5 through 7, this theme is picked up again. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And then it, it furthers, Therefore let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. God is a hiding place for us. Whereas earlier, we chose not to hide our sin from God. So when we bear our souls to God, when we make an honest confession, when we don't hide from God, God becomes a hiding place for us. And when we do not cover or hide the truth of our sin to God, the response is grace. God then covers that sin and says, I've got it covered. I'm no, no longer going to hold that against you. This really is a, a marvelous understanding of God's grace and the righteousness that we gain, not because of any merit on our part, not because of 
our worthiness because of the list of things that we did and uh, mistakes we didn't make, but rather uh, righteousness is imputed. The Lord imputes no iniquity. We're, con we're considered faithful and righteous through God's grace by being forgiven. All this comes from this, uh, this one psalm. And then the psalmist, once uh, he has gone through this personal experience, uh, listen to his own personal experience, and let's see where it takes us. While I, in verse 3, while I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Now, what does it mean, him keeping silence? It means that he's not making confession. He's not bearing his soul to God. He's hiding. He's finding a really bad hiding place in the soul of deception, if you will. He's, um, he's not admitting his sin to himself. He's not admitting his sin to the person that he sinned against or she sinned against and, um, and is not making it clear to God. So that kind of silence is a, is a bad thing. While I kept silence. And here's what happens when we keep silence, when we never acknowledge our sin to ourself, to the person we sinned against and to God. It says, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of, some, of, of summer. So he feels the, the weight of his guilt as if God is pressing down on him. But in this psalm, that's not what God wants. God is not trying to kill him, but rather his own silence. It is his silence that is wasting his body away. And then in verse 5, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity, my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And he does. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Grace. So the psalmist, from his own personal experience of confession and forgiveness, now understands the, um, the spiritual medicinal value of doing this and of not hiding his sin from God and of realizing that God will forgive. And then once forgiven, if you realize, beginning once uh, verse 5 is, uh, is said, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. For the rest of that psalm, you don't see words about his sin anymore. It's, I mean, when, you, when God forgives, it's forgiven. It's behind you. And it's not brought back out like uh, someone who shovels past onto you when they're trying to uh, get back at you or win an argument, which is a very unfair way of dealing with anger or resolving conflict with someone is to, to shovel past wounds. It's, that's foul play, hitting below the belt. God doesn't do that. Once God has forgiven, the thing is forgotten and not used as a tool to harm the person. Because Why? Because the person made a sincere, honest, open Confession to God. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now that he is uh, forgiven, it doesn't mean he can go around and, and continuing in that transgression. It means he is now free by God to live an upright life. And because of that freedom that God's grace has given him, he is counted as faithful and righteous. And so he picks up in verse 6. 
Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. So now he's turning from his personal experience of confession and forgiveness. He's now turning to the faithful. Remember, imagine that this psalm is being read out loud in the congregation in worship, which is what the psalm is meant. So the psalmist is turning to the faithful. All the congregation is hearing it and hearing these words. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. And these who are faithful, they are hearing this from someone who made a confession and is forgiven. Faithfulness does not mean that you are sinless. It means you are forgiven. So he's turning to the faithful who are uh, those who are forgiven. Let, the, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. So faithfulness, faithfulness, those who are faithful, are those who bring their prayers to God, including open confession. And by confessing and being forgiven, they remain faithful. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. The Lord will deliver us not only from our enemies, but from our sins. And then in verse 8, uh, there's an interesting two verses here because, well, let's, let's read it again and you'll see what I mean. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Now, the question is, who is saying this? Is it the psalmist or is it God? There are um, several scholars who will say that this, these two verses is actually the, uh, the words coming for, as if from the Lord. Others would say that it is from the psalmist who is now uh, forgiven and uh, back in the camp of uh, faithfulness uh, is now in, that he is the one that is instructing others. <clears throat> Personally, uh, it sounds more like it's f like from the words of God. Uh, it, it just seems to ring better. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Sounds like as if it would say, uh, says the Lord. Uh, it doesn't say says the Lord, but at least it feels like that to me, my own personal opinion. Uh, but whether it's from the words of God or whether it's from the, the psalmist, um, it is directed towards others, uh, to the faithful, to the congregation. And the, the meaning of the words, whether it's from the words of God, uh, according to the psalmist, or if it's from the psalmist himself, uh, the they are to be instructed and taught the way they should go. Um, and to not be stubborn like a horse or a mule, um, but, uh, but rather open vessels willing to learn from the psalmist's own experience of having made open confession and forgiveness. Now, what is so important about confession that we should speak the words to God. Um, well, the, uh, the word that I think of coming back to verse 2, and in whose spirit, happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, no guilt, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When we do not make confession, when we do not speak the words, put it out on the table, as it were, we deceive ourselves. And by deceiving ourselves, we deceive others, we deceive God. How many relationships are ruined because the person who has sinned has never said, I sinned, or I was wrong, I'm sorry, and make a good um, act of confession. Uh, there are people in this world who will never say, I am sorry, I made a mistake. 
And uh, part of accepting ourselves as human beings for what we are is being willing to say those words. When we don't, we deceive ourselves. We pretend to be something, someone that we are not. And that's, uh, there's another word for that. It's called hypocrite. A hypocrite is uh, someone who is acting a part, who's playing a pretense. And uh, so it's important that we make a good, honest uh, confession. Doesn't mean, and by doing so, we become faithful, righteous. Uh, not because of our own worthiness, not because of our own merits, but because we have been honest before God and have received God's grace of forgiveness. And then we can put that sin behind us and then begin to lead a, a better life. This passage uh, has great relevance for us in the season of Christmas as we realize that's why God came into the world. For, as the song goes, for poor, ornery people like you and like I. Uh, God came into the world because of, uh, of sinful people like us. Not like them, but like us. We Christians, we faithful Christians, we turn to God and make honest confession, knowing that through God's grace, through the gift that came at Christmas, uh, God makes forgiveness abundantly available and supremely available through Christ, who was very, very well familiar with Psalm 32. Others who knew Psalm 32 or the Apostle Paul, you might remember in uh, his letter to the Romans in chapter 4, we hear these verses in 6 through 8. So also David speaks of the blessedness of those to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those who in, whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. And that's a direct quote from Psalm 32 that begins uh, by those very words in verse 2. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Paul understands grace from Psalm 32. You know, where do you think, you know, where do you think uh, the New Testament Christians like Paul get all this understanding of justification by grace and um, the forgiveness that we have, God reckoning us as righteous, uh, not by any works, but by God's uh, grace. He gets it from the scriptures. He gets it from Psalm 32 and other, other places. St. Augustine, uh, one of the early Christian church um, evangelists, had Psalm 32 inscribed above his bed such that every day he woke up that was the first thing he would see happy are those whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered and then before he went to bed it's a great way of incorporating this psalm into uh, his everyday christian life um, so we have the recipe through Psalm 32, which Paul picks up in all later Christian thought as to um, how do we find forgiveness? How do, we lead, how do we lead a faithful and righteous life? By open acknowledgement of our sin, by accepting God's grace of forgiveness and putting it behind us, and by abiding in God's love and not our own abilities. Uh, because when we do try to abide in our, when we lean on our own abilities, we realize our own inability. So, open acknowledgement, acceptance of God's grace, and the intent to abide in God's love and to lead a new life. All of these are um, psalmist recipes and therefore Christian recipes for living a good
faithful, righteous life. And all that from one psalm. Well, God bless you in this day. And may you lead a righteous and faithful life, trusting in the grace that our Lord and Savior gives us as we make a good confession in our lives and uh, not try to hide from God, who, as we do not hide from God, God will not hide his grace from us, and we can constantly um, find a hiding place in our Lord. God bless and keep you. Take care. Bye-bye.